after the Vietnam War, when the United States Army uh, had less to do, then they had all this equipment. And of course, the Army would like to have new equipment. So they wanted to get rid of the old equipment. And so they offered it free to police departments. And the police department said, oh, sure, we're happy to have that. And so on. Now, what neither of them seemed to be aware of was that having all of this military equipment would require policemen to be trained in the use of this equipment. And that, in turn, would change their attitudes that instead of being on the side of the people on the street, they were like military invaders coming in on an enemy. This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today on Juneteenth with Dr. Peter Temin, someone I was lucky enough to become familiar with as an undergraduate at MIT. He's a professor emeritus at MIT in economic history. His forthcoming book, Never Together, An Economic History of a Segregated America, is just extraordinary. This is the second podcast we've made. There was a working paper that he made, which was a segment or chapter that foreshadowed what would be in the book last year on this podcast series. But uh, he's got a new working paper that just came out on the INET website, and it is called Mass Incarceration, Mass Incarceration Retards Racial Integration. I think this is a painful, but very, very important topic. Peter, thanks for joining us, and thanks for continuing to illuminate the challenges that America must face. Okay, thank you, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here, and a pleasure to... Uh participate in an INET uh, podcast again. And uh, so uh, I'd like to make uh, focus on the uh, INET working paper and people can look at that for more details of what I'm going to say uh, right at the beginning here. But there are two points that I'm making in this paper. And one is the point that mass incarceration, which affects black Americans much more than white Americans, because blacks are only 13% of our population, but they are 40% of our, of our prisoners. Uh, that one is that it ruins the lives of a lot of young, poor blacks uh, who never finish school. They are restricted in what they can earn uh, as, as an adult, uh, taken back into their families. But uh, really, and often don't have any families uh, there uh, for that. So that's the effect on the blacks. The effect on the whites is to confirm their view of blacks as unruly, illegal, uh, otherwise, uh, whatever negative thoughts you want to have on the blacks. But they are not members of society. Mm -hmm. And so a point that I make uh, in the paper and in the book uh, more forcibly is uh, that this affects uh, poor blacks and uh, uneducated blacks. And as a result of President uh, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, we have what uh, Richard Freeman of, uh, of uh, Harvard called a black elite. That is to say, black 
people who have gone through school, often quite good schools, have done well, uh, and then have professional jobs of one sort or another who are accepted into this uh, kind of dominant life and can earn money and so on. And so that there is this kind of ambiguity that if you are a prominent, uh, educated black, you are accepted. But if you are an uneducated black male in prison or having been released from prison, you are dirt. And so not accepted into society. So it's both a, a uh, race issue and it's also a class issue mm -hmm. that this affects not the entire black population, but it affects the uneducated black uh, population. So I think it's fine that the Koch brothers, it's not the Koch brothers anymore, it's, it's Charles Koch, are supporting education, but I haven't seen any evidence of it yet. I mean, I've seen, you know, in, in uh, First Step Act, uh, but the court just restricted the access of uh, the, first, uh, the First Step Act. And there has not been a second step either in an act or in state organizations or things, you would think that would be a perfect uh, thing to start on because that was passed in the Trump administration. And so the people who want bipartisan work could then introduce this in a democratic uh, administration and get bipartisan support for it. Uh, but I don't see uh, Charles Koch making that that uh, statement, and uh, if he should, I would welcome it. Now, there are a number of things that uh, I, I would say are quite mysterious in reading your working paper. I remember a quote where Glenn Row Lowry said, well, the intensity of this prison industrial system and so forth is going up even the, and incarceration rates are going up easy, even as crime rates are going down. Uh, what, what, tell us a little bit about the history. I mean, obviously black people were not treated fairly and those are other chapters in your book, but when did this frontier, the mass incarceration come okay. to the forefront as part of what you might call the repressive toolkit well, uh, this, this started, had its start in the Nixon administration when uh, Nixon uh, replaced Johnson's war on poverty with a war on crime and so on. And this was greatly expanded in the Reagan administration uh, and then became known as a war on drugs. Now, the war on drugs then was amplified in the 1980s by, uh, there was a drug epidemic there which got everybody excited. And the penalties were a hundred times as high for the kind of of, uh, of coke, uh, of uh, uh, narcotics, uh, for the the form that blacks like, than for the form that uh, whites like. It's the difference between crack cocaine and powdered cocaine, mm -hmm. and uh, and so that led to this. Uh, 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 well, that and policing and so on, 
led to uh, the progress of, of uh, mass incarceration. And what several people have found uh, in research studies is that at the same time that the uh, mass incarceration was involving more prisoners, the drug uh, crimes uh, were decreasing. In other words, these things were going in opposite directions. Now, you can see this. The, the drug things were uh, uh, supported more by, uh, by Republican administrations than by uh, Democratic. But while you can see the difference, the difference is not large. And so let me take an example from President Clinton's administration, uh, because he was trying to uh, take advantage of the hysteria about uh, Blacks by having both more police to deal with the crimes and having more social services to provide alternate activities to help the Blacks and the incriminated Blacks, the, the people who had been uh, uh, freed from prison, do some healthy activities uh, and kind of motivate themselves in a way. He didn't talk about education particularly, but to, to get them on a different track where they might go back to school then for that. And the Republican legislature stripped out all this, uh, all, all the social services. And uh, people watching this podcast may recall the controversy over midnight basketball, which became the symbol of all of these social mm -hmm. services and the source for Republicans to strip all this out of the bill. Nonetheless, in the mid 80s, President Clinton signed the bill, put 100,000 more policemen out on the streets. He has subsequently said that he regrets signing the bill. But of course, that's a couple of decades after the, uh, the, uh, the act that he did and he no longer has any political office. So it's uh, kind of comforting that he comes to that realization, uh, but it's a little late for uh, yeah. public policy. Yeah. It's, it's better than denial, but it's uh, because time, so much time yeah. has passed, the damage has been done, but it, that, but it is, it is, exactly. uh, in, how would exactly. I say? Exactly, the damage, but, but it's not just that the damage has been done, it's that the damage continues. That's right. But but his acknowledgement may help, I may mean, contribute like your work to trying to change this course. So uh, it it can't, it may yeah. not be enough, but it's it's in Let's the plus go. column, however small. But <laughs> that's uh, yeah. So exactly. there are a lot of different dimensions exactly. to this. Uh, one that no, there are a lot of dimensions. Let please. me mention one dimension before you go, which is that. Uh, one of the uh, federal aims in the expansion of mass incarceration was to take the recommended sentences that had been uh, promoted by the government to try to standardize uh, courts around the country became uh, mandatory signs, mm -hmm. mandatory uh, punishments for various uh, uh, crimes. Now, at the same time, in local uh, jurisdictions, the funds for uh, public defenders were 
restricted and were limited uh, and kind of disappeared. And so the prosecutors were uh, seeing these people in their offices uh, rather than in a courtroom. And in a courtroom, they would say, look, if you're here under a drug thing, the minimum is five, five years. But if you'll uh, uh, plead guilty to a, uh, say, uh, stealing a car or st uh, stealing something or uh, uh, hitting somebody, some aggression kind of thing, then we have more freedom and I can give you a shorter uh, term, one or two years. And so uh, in our prisons, when you look at state prisons, state uh, drug offenses are a minority of the uh, convictions huh? of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, sorry of the uh, crimes that they're in for. But this is the result of the minimum uh, sentences and the prosecutors getting more influence mm. than oh, the boy. courts. That's fierce. Uh, <coughs> one of the things that uh, is mentioned in your working paper is the, what you might call militarization of law enforcement uh -huh. and the discipline in the prisons. Uh, yes. Does this start as <clears throat> people return from Vietnam or is this more a, a little bit later in time? But but tell us a little bit about what that uh, change in the nature of both law no. enforcement and prison administration implies. <clears throat> yes, this has been going on for a long time and I'm not uh, I think in the book, the timing is, uh, is explained uh, in more detail that uh, after the Vietnam War, when the United States Army uh, had less to do, uh, then they had all this equipment. And of course, the Army would like to have new equipment. So they wanted to get rid of the old equipment. And so they offered it free to uh, police departments. And the police department said, oh, sure, we're happy to have that, and so on. Now, what neither of them seemed to be aware of was that having all of this military equipment would require policemen to be trained in the use of this equipment. And that in turn would change their attitudes that instead of being on the side of the people on the street, they were like military invaders coming in on an enemy. And so it tended to uh, spread the police being very hostile to the uh, to the uh, 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 typically black street crimes that were going on. And so if you recall the uh, the original uh, or uh, not the original one, but uh, prominent uh, uh, black uh, fellow who was about to go to college, uh, I'm blocking on his name at the moment, in a suburb of St. Louis uh, for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was shot by the police and laid on the, in the street for six hours before anybody picked up the dead body. But there were riots that night and the police showed up in military equipment, in tr fortified troop carriers, in having all of this equipment come in 
and it really did look like a wartime invasion of the uh, of this suburb of society, uh, except that all the weapons were on the police side, and there were peaceful demonstrations on the other side. And so you can get other examples for them. That's one that yes. stands up in my mind. When I was uh, growing up in Detroit Sorry. in the uh, late 60s, yes. Mayor Roman Gribbs created something right. called the Stress Force. Stop the rioting, enjoy safe streets. Yeah. And it was essentially, from what I understood, yeah. people were hired who were former Green Berets that came home from Vietnam. And they were a plain closed operation that was in large part used to intimidate the black population. Though I, the, it was, how would I say, etched into my mind very powerfully because my father was a urologist and a Caucasian urologist who was a good friend of his, lived in our community, was driving home one night when plainclothes people stopped him in downtown Detroit. In those days, that was scary. They didn't right. identify themselves as police and they pulled right. him out of the car and they beat, it, beat the tar out of him. And uh, he, he had later said, well, I was yeah. quite inflamed because I was quite scared. But he had no idea what was happening to him. And eventually, the mayor, Coleman Young, the black mayor who took over, in large part, mobilized his campaign around ending the stress force. And so this was a very, very tangible experience. I got pulled over by the stress force a couple of times in, uh, when I was in high school. And uh, I, how would I put it? I wasn't under their zoom lens. It was the black population that was. But they were pretty, pretty forceful, pretty, uh, right. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one example that's a little bit graphic. I was driving my car, my mother's car, Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser station wagon, taking some guys downtown yeah. to see a music show. And a guy in a Volkswagen yeah. said, pull over. And he put a, he's a plainclothes guy in a Volkswagen. He put a badge out the window. His partner did out the yeah. uh passenger front window and one of my friends in the back was a smart aleck and he said where'd you yeah. get that in a cracker jack box he pulled out a big pistol and pointed it at me <laughs> i i have not had a gun pointed at me yeah. again in my life but uh so the, this was the kind of things you're talking about yeah. i guess a lot of the urban black population those who rose up in the 67 riots and others had experienced a great deal of, even at that time. But it seems like it's only accelerated since the late 1960s. And uh, I, I thought it was a very haunting experience. Yes, and I think that's right. And that's a good example, uh, because that doesn't make the news, but it affects very much the way people's lives are lived. Uh, to be harassed. Uh, one way or another by the police. And there is a lot of research on this. And uh, people say, you know, uh, you know, that it's not so bad, but it is clearly racially uh, done uh, and uh, uh, racially determined that they're much more likely to hit uh, people with dark skins people with light skins, although your last example suggests if you have teenagers in your uh, car, uh, you may be liable to be pulled over and terrorized, uh, independent of the color. So that it affects there. And one that must remember that in mass incarceration, the majority of prisoners are white. You know, this is damage to the white community. And that's important for the United States because by taking all these people out of the educational system, then what happens to these people is that if they're very bright, 
are very inventive, they have no way of capitalizing on that and getting there. And so it affects the progress that the United States will make. But disproportionately, almost half of the prisoners are black, even though blacks are less than one sixth of the population. And so it's much more proportionally set for blacks. But mass incarceration is affecting the future of America by taking all these people out of the labor force. And it does so by another mechanism entirely. Don't think of the individuals. Think about the financing of prisons. Because if we were to take, let's say we were to reduce the uh, uh, mass incarceration by half, still maintaining the proportions, that would send out whites as well as blacks into uh, other sorts. And it would free up the funds that are now given to prisons to have mm -hmm. uh, more education. Mm -hmm. So I describe that yeah, in yeah. the paper as a win-win situation. When I read that, the when I read that portion, the country, I well thought of a helping the people. The problem is here is political because the prisons are typically located mm -hmm. in the country, out of the cities where the real estate is cheaper. So it provides mm -hmm. uh, jobs for rural people. And those people tend to be supported by, uh, tend to support Republicans and be... Uh, their uh, uh, kind of uh, part of their base, the rural base. And so uh, the Republicans have been very resistant to decreasing the uh, presence of these rural mm -hmm. prisons in, in the rural areas. And partly because they don't know what would replace them. Now, President Biden has suggested that getting uh, the internet to be a national phenomenon rather than an urban phenomenon and getting uh, hi-fi and uh, uh, fast hi-fi available in the rural areas would provide an avenue for other activities to go on. And uh, one of the lessons of the pandemic mm -hmm. is that people can work from afar uh, over the internet if they have access to it. And so if they were to do this, to allow Biden's infrastructure plan to get through, it might decrease the importance of all mm -hmm. of these prisons in these rural areas. And so they are opposed to the infrastructure plan as well. That seems far removed from mass incarceration. But you see, if you take yes. the finance... Well, I, there were a number of thoughts that came to mind direct. as I was reading your working paper based on you joined me in 2016 at the Detroit conference that I did. And as I was researching for that, I met a woman from University of Michigan who unfortunately couldn't uh, attend the conference, but she helped me with lots of issues. Her name is Heather Ann Thompson. Uh, she's recently written a book about Attica prison that's quite prominent. But Heather Ann yeah. Thompson showed me some of her work. And there were you were talking about the win-win situation of more money liberated for education, people out of the prison. But there's a third dimension that I heard from her. She studied what happened to the performance of children in Detroit public schools when the acceleration of their fathers being put in jail 
took place and the performance dropped markedly in the yeah. schools where the where the fathers had been in some substantial amount taken off to prison. Uh, she also spoke a great deal about the state politics that you referred to. Uh, she taught me that when there was a census in Michigan, the men from Detroit, both men and women, who had committed or been convicted of felonies, I don't know whether they committed them, they had been convicted of felonies, they are not allowed to vote. But for the census, they weren't counted at where their home and residence was. They were counted as population where they were in prison out state, which strengthened the out of city, out state Republican Party relative to the Democratic Party in the state legislature. And there was a lot of outrage yeah. about that uh, in and around the time of the Detroit bankruptcy, <laughs> where the out of city state legislature was trying to play a very aggressive role in the restructuring of the city of Detroit. And so you're correct. And that's uh, exactly what's going on. And so the census is also involved in this by that ruling, which is now quite an old rule of mm -hmm. where these people are given as living. And so that accentuates yes. the in political your, uh, problem. Working paper at the end, after the references, are a number of graph graphical exhibits of various different facets. Uh, and I think this is important to give a right. sense of proportion at, about the, the scale of the change in America. Because you talk about cumulative risk of imprisonment yeah. in 1945 to 1949, and then again in 65 to 69, and you just see an explosion of the, of the risk of going to prison. For black people who are high school dropouts, it goes from four to 11. Uh, among white people yes. who were in college, who had some college, at least some college, it went from one to one. <laughs> it didn't change. Yeah. And the only, yeah. how do I say, it's hard to find good news right. in here. But the only good news was among blacks who had gone to college, or at least had some college. It went from six down to five. Yeah. But the idea that it's still five times, yeah. for college educated people, it was five times what it was for white people. And I'm not saying college education makes you honest. I'm saying it probably takes, uh, it gives you a greater probability of employment alleviating despair. But looking at those numbers, and then you have another graph yeah. right after that, it's called figure one, the incarceration rate as an aggregate. Now you've said 40% are black, while only 14% of the population. But you watch the United States on this graph from 1925 to 1975. It's essentially 100 people per 100,000. By, by 2010, it's 500 per 100,000. That's right. And it's that's gone up by a factor mean, of five. That, yes, well, you see, and in other uh, post-industrial countries in Western Europe and so on, the people we identify with, it's remained yes. the incarceration yes. rate. That's that's an important other dimension. It's remained hundred thousand, and one for a hundred thousand. And so mm -hmm. we are unusual. This is an American mm -hmm. phenomenon. This mass incarceration and racial mass incarceration is very much. This is yes. Jim Crow. 2.0, as various people have said. Well, I think the... To keep uh, the black population down. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to see because through, uh, how would I say, the history of my own work on Capitol Hill, I worked in the United States Senate for six years. Some of the people I knew who were down there were telling me stories that yeah. both what I'll call moderate Republicans and Democrats have been starting to rise up against 
this, many of the Republicans, not on humane grounds, but on the ridiculous cost of this, that this is making society worse off at a tremendous cost to a society that has to marshal its resources productively. And I do remember a very uh, prominent bipartisan op-ed in the New York Times, Jason Furman, who had spent time at the Council of Economic Advisors under Obama, and on the other side was uh, Doug Holtzaken, who was right. a student of Alan Blinders, but very involved in the Republican Congressional Budget Office and so on. They co-authored an op-ed complaining about this. I've heard more recently that some of the Koch Brothers Foundation and others have been very involved in trying to change this course because, first of all, the waste of money, and the secondly, what you call the lose-lose situation needs to be reversed. What What is creating the persistence of clinging to this past policy? Are there vested interests who are making a lot of money, like owners of prisons who get cheap laborers? Or uh, I know there's a young man who was a postdoc who I remember was interviewed by Joseph Stiglitz and by INET for a postdoc, and he did a dissertation that showed that the wages in the communities around where the prisons were located were going down and business failures were going up because they couldn't compete with that approximately zero wage of labor inside the prison. So there's all kinds of negative side effects. But my, my question to you is, where is the resistance to the constructive change that you make, what you might call, obvious in this working paper? Okay, well, the, the resistance comes from several different directions. And one direction is just, if you've been doing it for a while, it's hard to change. We all know that, we get into habits. And so the police, as we've talked before, are in the habit, the public defenders, uh, the, the uh, prosecutorial uh, uh, lawyers are in this, and so on, and the, the, the uh, budgets are in this. Okay. Second thing is there is a growth of private prisons. Uh, private prisons are more, uh, they only have about 10% of the American prisoners. But of course, we have so many prisoners, that's still substantial. And they're more in uh, housing immigrants than housing uh, native born black people. But they're there and they send lobbyists to Congress saying, you know, give us more resources, 10 more people there, and so on. So uh, just as lobbyists for other things uh, go along. A third thing is uh, this geography. And as you say, there are a lot of problems with rural America and uh, the uh, uh, prisons have uh, ambiguous effects. Uh, nonetheless, they do provide a lot of support for people to stay in those uh, rural areas. And so uh, that proposes political support it tends to go toward a Republican uh, uh, Congress uh, for that, and they are reluctant to give that up uh, for that. And then, of course, finally, the things that we've said, this has been going on for half a century. So it's in regulations that come from the military giving uh, 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 military equipment to the police, to the census classifying residents as their prison home rather than their actual uh, family home, that you have the uh, state laws set up with, uh, with uh, uh, minimum sentences for some of effects, and that gives rise to this out-of-court settlement process 
and so on. So there are just lots and lots and lots of ways in which the given structure, and this leads us back to the first thing I said, which is, is you've done this for half a century, it's very hard to get you out of it for that. Now, in the paper, I argue you don't have to get go back to the whole way. There's a model underneath the paper, and it suggests strongly that if you go back to a middle course that is uh, in there where the laws are less severe, uh, that then the progress of, of the uh, legal system would get you eventually back to our original level. Uh, that will take time. Uh, and that's a legal uh, effort so that the, uh, I think at the moment, the most promising change would be to have the, uh, follow the, the uh, First Step Act, or well, the, uh, uh, the act under President Obama uh, to try to equalize mm -hmm. the penalties for crack cocaine and powder cocaine. And then the first act, uh, first step act under Trump to try to alleviate some of this is the way to go. And so I think if they could just say, we're not trying to solve the problem at once. What we're trying to do is to reduce the resources that are needed for it by decreasing it over time, that then we might be able to support legal changes that would reduce the penalties that come in various ways to the less educated members of our society, and, uh, both white and black. I think there's another dimensioned in what you talk, the win-win of coming out of funding prisons and redirecting the money to education. With the advent of the so-called technological or internet age, you refer to it a little bit in the how we're learning from the pandemic, more and more work is knowledge intensive. It used to be you could use some muscles to get a pretty good job. Bill Lozanik just wrote a working paper that I made a uh, podcast on this week about okay. the undoing of the black middle class as globalization and uh, automation technology took people out of that workforce. Yeah. But in at this time, with what's been revealed through the pandemic, with the technology that's present, yeah. it seems to me for social sustainability, the need to step up knowledge intensive funding going back to your earlier book the vanishing middle class the rungs in the ladder from low margin services to high margin services have been devastated and there's a call to action now that i think is extremely important and given the imperatives of climate given the funding or the pandemic we've just been through finding healthy uses for money related to knowledge intensive education has got to be one of our highest priorities. And you've yes. identified a sack of gold that can be redirected to that purpose. Yes, well, I've been focused very much on mass incarceration on this uh, podcast, but you're right. The economy has changed greatly and that has been accelerated in the pandemic that we're now coming out of it, this uh, mm -hmm. Juneteenth, 19, uh, two, 2021. And so that the factory life that was uh, the mainstay and the main uh, attraction for blacks in the Great Migration that ended in 1970, 
have disappeared. They started disappearing starting in the 1970s as automation came in. And that has continued for a half a century, very much the same half century that, uh, that uh, uh, mass incarceration has grown. That the uh, ideal has been to, uh, to uh, uh, that, that what you need to get a decent job in the new economy is more education. And so that gives an urgency to increasing the educational system in mm -hmm. our country. But I wrote a paper a long time ago now uh, about the fact that teachers' pay was not increasing. They were stagnant wages and that the women who gained access to the pill and then control over their family life could then go for higher paying and more demanding jobs and jobs that were worthy of their intellect. When, like my own daughter, who is an emergency department uh, physician at Mass General Hospital for that. So that uh, you go there and, and you get out of uh, the teachers, uh, I'm sure are very hardworking, very good, but it's hard to attract the best teachers if you only pay low wages because the other jobs are out there and they will attract the potential teachers better. So that you not only have to educate yes. people more, but you've got to change the educational system so that you could pay pe teachers more they could make the classes more attractive. And then that's the other side of the coin. One is the supply, the other is the demand, and so on, so that you could get uh, more there. But you are exactly right that the change in the economy makes all of these issues Yes, I mentioned stuff. Heather Ann Thompson's work and about more uh, how Detroit, when the fathers were, were put in jail, the children's performance dropped. I forgot one dimension, which resonates with what you just said. Because you yes. get to a place where Robert, the teachers are being judged on the kids' performance also. on standardized tests. <laughs> and when the fathers go to jail and the traumas come from things beyond their control, the high quality yeah. teachers vacate the areas that are traumatized. So you have a supply shock that's induced by the incarceration of, of, of mothers or fathers. And uh, so there's a whole lot of damage going on in this realm that you explore. Oh, and yeah. I find it uh, very important and that's very right. illuminating. I wanted to uh, conclude by saying that in almost every realm, I've always learned a great deal from you, starting as an undergraduate, knowing you through Tom Ferguson, looking at your work on the 1930s. One of the things that makes a great scholar is knowing what ch questions to choose. Yeah. And I don't know what it is that's inside your heart but I recently have been monitoring, a, and, oh, I've been taking a course, an adult education course at the Union Theological Seminary. It's taught by a brilliant man named Obery Hendricks, and who is a professor there and formerly worked on Wall right. Street. And it's called The Kingdom of God and Political Economy. And the person who keeps coming back to what to do is Martin Luther King Jr. And they describe the essential ingredients in how Martin Luther King found his courage. Mm 
they talk about he cultivated a certain love and a certain righteousness right. and a certain courage and what the, he called from the Hebrew Bible hesed, a, a deep love. And, and he, meaning Dr. Hendricks, shared with us pieces that he'd written that Dr. King obviously was subject to an awful lot of danger, physical danger, and was ultimately murdered. But he went inside and he found with that pursuit yeah. of truth and pursuit of righteousness yeah. and that loving notion called hesed, which he was very conscious of, the stamina to continue to do good work for society. And when I see you while I'm taking that course in these weeks, I can see that you have a lot of that inside of you. And I want to, I want to applaud that and I want to thank you for that. And I want to ask you, where do you get it from? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I think I get it. And uh, I think uh, my mother uh, was very invested. I grew up in Philadelphia, in Germantown. And my mother established a group uh, called Public Education in uh, P.E. Pep uh, uh, mm -hmm. in, in uh, public, edu public education in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and uh, which my brother ran for some years. And so uh, after her death. Yes, uh, and mm -hmm. so education uh, has been a center of my life uh, through that going through. And the importance of education has been uh, proclaimed. And that's, of course, we can do all these things uh, and say we're great doing them. <laughs> but it comes basically from my family coming in. And then what I chose was to be a college professor, to be an economic historian, uh, which I've enjoyed very much. 